I love the name of this week, Passion Week. I mean, you know, Jesus was passionate about what he was sent here by the Father to accomplish. And it concludes with Passion Week, the most significant week in the life of Christ. And I pray that it is also one of the most significant weeks in our lives as well. So I'd like to go with you to Mark chapter 11, and we're, we're going to look at the story of Christ's triumphal entry and draw, I like to call them life principles, some things that you and I can relate to and apply to our lives and our walk with Christ today. Mark chapter 11, let's begin there in verse 1. And when they drew nigh to Jerusalem, to Bethphage and Bethany, at the Mount of Olives, he sent out two of his disciples. And remember, the Mount of Olives is the hillside that overlooks the walled city of Jerusalem. And it was on Palm Sunday that Jesus rode down the path of the Mount of Olives, halfway down, if you go to Jerusalem, you go to Israel today, there's what they call the Teardrop Church. It's where Jesus paused and he wept over the city. He wept because they did not recognize their day of visitation. And then he eventually went down and crossed the Kidron Valley, there's a, a small little creek down at the bottom of the Mount of Olives. On the Mount of Olives, it's, it's a rich person cemetery. A lot of rich people are buried there because, of course, rich Jewish people, because, of course, they don't believe the Lord's already come. They're still waiting for him to come, and they know that when he comes... It says in the, in the Old Testament, in the book of Zechariah, he's going to put his two feet down on the Mount of Olives. So when the dead in Christ rise first, they believe they're going to be the first ones that are going to rise and see him. But the Bible says the Lord's going to put his two feet down on the Mount of Olives. It's going to split open. And then Jesus is going to go down through the eastern gate or the gate called beautiful that was the the gate that the lame man in acts chapter 3 sat by right now it's cemented and it's concreted closed but praise god it's going to open and the lord's going to go through it and enter into the holy city of jerusalem when he comes back I mean, you can't make this stuff up. It's so good. It's so, the Bible, the Word of God, the, pro, the prophecies of hundreds and thousands of years ago are going to come to pass. Every I is going to be dotted. Every T is going to be crossed. And the Word of the Lord is going to be fulfilled. Hallelujah. So, that's where Jesus went on his Palm Sunday walk. And in verse 2, he said to them, Go into the village over across from you, and as soon as you have entered into it, you will find a colt tied on which no one has ever sat. Untie it, loose it, and bring it to me. And if anyone shall say to you, why do you do this? You say, the Lord has need of him. And immediately he will send him here. So, I love how that clearly tells us you'll find a cult that no man, no person has ever sat on before. You know, I believe that there are some things in life that are set aside. I like to call them, they're, they're sanctified. They're consecrated. They're really not ours. They're set aside for the Lord's use. And I believe that this cult was just that. I believe this was a sanctified cult. Amen. 
No one ever sat on it before. Why? Because it was there only for the Lord to use during his triumphal entry into Jerusalem. You know, there are some things I believe that are set apart only for the Lord's use. One of them, of course, is the Sabbath day. The seventh day. The Bible says in six days, the Lord created everything. He created the heavens and the earth and everything around us we see. But on the seventh day, he rested. Now, how many of you know if the Lord can do everything in six days and rest on the seventh, he expects the same of us. In Isaiah chapter 58, the last two verses, verses 13 and 14, here's what the Lord says to us. He says, if you turn your foot because of the Sabbath from doing what you please on my holy day and call the Sabbath a delight, holy of the Lord, honorable, and you shall honor him, not doing your own ways, nor finding your own pleasure, nor speaking your own words. Then you shall delight yourself in the Lord, and I will cause you to ride on the high places of the earth, and feed you with the inheritance of Jacob, your father, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken it. How many of you believe when we honor God, he will honor us? The Bible doesn't say which day. It just says one out of every seven days we need to cease from doing our own pleasure, cease from doing our own thing. That day is to be consecrated and sanctified and dedicated to the Lord. I believe one of the greatest problems in America today is workaholics. People that just are working, 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 working seven days a week, all the time, never taking a break, always trying to get ahead. But you know what? You will get farther ahead if you take one day out of seven and honor the Lord with it. Now, do I have to amen myself today? That's good <laughs> preaching right there. Amen. It's true. It's true. We need to, how many of you were glad when you got up this morning and said, thank God it's Sunday. I was glad when they said unto me, let us go to the house of the Lord. See, if we delight ourselves in the Sabbath, it's been set apart this one day out of seven to honor God. Another thing that I believe is sanctified is the tithe. One-tenth, the first fruits of everything that comes in your life. It's not really yours. It's not mine. It's the Lord's. We don't pay our tithe. We actually return our tithe because it's God's. We're giving back to him what is rightfully his, and we're honoring him with our first fruits. And if we withhold our tithe, the Bible says we're robbing God. We're stealing from him. The book of Leviticus chapter 27 and verse 30 says, Leviticus 27, 30, And all the tithe of the land, whether of the seed of the land or of the fruit of the tree, is the Lord's and it is holy. So the tithe, number one, it's not ours, it's the Lord's. Number two, it's holy. It's set apart. It's sanctified. When you get your income, when you get paid, when you get a gift, when you find money, whatever it is, one-tenth of that, you need to see it differently. You need to set it apart from the rest of it. It's holy and it's the Lord's. In the Old Testament, the firstborn male was dedicated to the Lord. They would dedicate that firstborn son and say, this child is God's. 
The anointing oil in the Old Testament, when they made the anointing oil in the book of Leviticus, it was not allowed to be used for any other thing except to anoint and consecrate people and articles. And then how many of you know we have been set apart for the Lord? In 1 Peter 2, 9, it says, But you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people. Doesn't mean you're strange. That word peculiar means you are owned by one alone. We are the Lord's. He bought us with a price, his very own blood. Hallelujah. A peculiar people that you might show forth the praises of him who has called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Just like that donkey was sanctified and set apart only for the Lord's use to ride. So you and I have been sanctified and set apart for him. Now, why don't we set apart this week and not treat it like every other week? This is Holy Week. This is the week that changed the world. This is the week, yes, it began with a triumphal entry into Jerusalem, but then Jesus eventually, he, he, he went to the cross, he was crucified, he shed his blood, he died and gave his life and was laid in the tomb, but then on the third day, day hallelujah he arose from the grave and he conquered death and provided salvation for all of us thank God no other week like this week let's set it apart let's consecrate this week to the Lord let's draw near to the Lord this week this is the culmination of our 40-day journey. On Palm Sunday, while Jesus is coming into Jerusalem, riding on a donkey through the eastern gate, Pilate, almost at the same time, is coming through the western gate with his Roman soldiers and legion of army. Jesus' army was a group of children and people that took off their cloaks and broke branches off of trees. That's why we gave you a palm branch today. And they laid them down, and they worshiped him. Hallelujah. And maybe Jesus came humbly, and maybe Jesus came in a way that the people were not expecting. And that's a good word for some of you, because how many know the Lord often never comes the way we expect him to come? Amen? But he did make his triumphal entry, riding on a donkey that had never been sat upon before. Why don't you set apart this week as holy unto the Lord, the week that changed the world? And let Christ change us this week. Some of you would like to Christ to change you this week. Amen. Wouldn't that be wonderful? Ah, oh, I believe if we treat this week differently, he can and he will because I believe he wants to. Now, the second thing in that Palm Sunday story, Jesus said, when you find the colt, that no man, no one ever sat upon. Untie him, loose him. Somebody say, loose him. Loose him. 
and let him go. And if anybody asks you, why are you doing that? You tell them, because the Lord has need of him. Can I tell you something? The Lord has need of you and me. The Lord went to the cross, hallelujah, during this holy week, and he loosed us from the power of sin and Satan, and he set us free because the Lord has need of us. The Lord has need of you. The second thing that happened is you and I have been justified this week. That word justified means just as if we have never sinned. You see, he who knew no sin became sin for us so that you and I who knew no righteousness could be called the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. See, the Bible says sin separated us from God. Oh, but Jesus came down to the earth. He lived a sinless life. And this week, the week that changed the world, he went to the cross and he shed his blood because without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sins. And you and I that were once separated from God have now been reconciled back to the Father. He has freed us. I'm going to thank God you're free today. Hallelujah. Free from sin. Free from this world. Free from Satan and the enemy of our life. Hallelujah. He whom the Son sets free is free indeed. See, but, but how can the Lord use me? I've, I've, I've made mistakes. I'm, I'm not perfect. I've, I've messed up. I've, uh, I've, I've got faults. Hey, listen, it was the lamb that had to be without blemish, not the donkey. Amen. Thank God the Lord uses people that have faults. The Lord uses people that have weaknesses. The Lord uses people that aren't perfect. Why? Because he who is perfect paid the price so that you and I could be free that he might use all of us. Thank God. I believe we are living in a day that we are going to see an outpouring of the Holy Spirit on the earth like this world has never seen. And God is raising up an army, hallelujah, to advance his kingdom in the earth. And he needs you. He needs you. He needs you. That's why he loosed you. I mean, no, you can't serve the Lord when you're all bound up. You can't serve the Lord when you're not free. When Jesus called Lazarus to come forth, the Bible says he came out of the grave with grave clothes wrapped around his body all the way down to his feet. He had a napkin over his face, and the Lord said to the other people there, you loose him and let him go. Why? Because I have need of Lazarus. He still has work to do. Can I say to you today, the Lord has need of you. And if it's not time for you to go, if God's not done with you, no matter what the enemy throws at you, no matter what he sends your way to try to take you out and take you down, it's not going to work because God has need of you. If it's not time for you to go home yet, the Lord is going to use you. Hallelujah. Thank God. Thank God. And then back in Mark 11, 
and verse 7, it says, And they brought the colt to Jesus, and they threw their garments on it, and he sat on it. And many spread their garments in the way, and others cut down branches off the trees, and they scattered them in the way. And those going before and those following cried out, saying, Hosanna! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the kingdom of our father David who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. And the third thing that happened on that Palm Sunday walk is they recognized Christ as their Messiah. They recognized that he was their king and their Lord and their God, and they glorified him. Hallelujah. They gave him praise and glory. They maybe were expecting a physical king to come with a physical triumphant army to defeat the Romans, but instead he comes riding on a donkey with people waving branches and laying their coats on the path, crying out, He is our Messiah, He is our King, and He is worthy to be praised. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And Jesus said, listen, I'm going to tell you something. I am going to get praised. And if you don't praise me, the rocks are going to cry out and give me praise. I don't know about you, but no rock's going to take my place. Come on, somebody give the Lord praise. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. The Jews were looking for a king to come in royal fashion with an army to deliver them from the hands of the Romans. But instead, oh, Jesus comes humbly on a donkey. And he enters the city with outbreaks of praise and a declaration that the Messiah has finally come. In the book of Philippians, chapter 2, and verse 8, the apostle Paul writes these words, And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself, and he became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Therefore, God has highly exalted him and has given him a name which is above every name. Come on, somebody shout his name. Jesus! <clears throat> I don't think we realize what goes on in the heavenly realm when we speak and sing and pray and shout the name of Jesus Christ, our Messiah and Lord. Hallelujah. Verse 10, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow. Of things in heaven, of things on earth, I like this, and even of things under the earth. I mean, you know, there's a day that every demon in hell is going to bow the knee to Jesus Christ, the Messiah. And that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of the Father. So Jesus was glorified on this Palm Sunday walk. But Jesus knew what awaited him in the days ahead. He knew that he had to go to the cross and give his very life. He knew he was the sacrificial lamb. See, in the book of Exodus, there were three requirements for the lamb, the Passover lamb. Number one, it had to be a male. Number two, 
It had to be without spot or blemish. But number three, the lamb had to die. And on that first Good Friday, the day that Jesus died, they were celebrating the Passover. They were celebrating Passover that very day. The day the lamb had to be slain. Jesus is our Passover lamb. And his death and his resurrection, they were actually a fulfillment of prophecy that was given to Joseph and Mary before Christ was ever born. Go back to the Gospel of Matthew with me quickly, to chapter 1 and verse 18. This is actually the Christmas story. But I'm here to tell you what Jesus did this week fulfilled why he was born and why he came to the earth. In Matthew 1 and verse 18, it says, Now the birth of Jesus Christ was this way. For his mother Mary was betrothed to Joseph before they came together. She was found to be with child by the Holy Spirit. But Joseph, her husband-to-be, being a just man and not willing to make her of a public example, he purposed to put her away secretly. And as he thought upon these things, the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not fear to take to you Mary as your wife, for that which is in her is fathered of the Holy Spirit. And she shall bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. And here is the fulfillment of this prophecy. For he shall save his people from their sins. So remember when Jesus was born, and he was in the house, probably just a couple of, day, of years old, the wise men show up from the east, and they present him gold, declaring, Jesus, you are the king. They gave him incense, declaring, Jesus, you are worthy. Come on, you are worthy to be praised and worshiped. But then they gave him the gift of myrrh, now, myrrh was a burial ointment. And what they were basically doing, they were prophesying to the Lord at his young age, saying, Lord, even though you were just recently born, you actually were born to die. And Jesus knew that all of his life. He knew that even though they were praising him and breaking branches off and laying their coats on the path for him to enter into Jerusalem, he knew within just a few days what awaited him. He knew he had to give his life. He knew that he had to shed his blood and be the sacrificial lamb for without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sins. And Jesus fulfilled prophecies that were given before he was ever born and even thousands of years ago in the Old Testament. He fulfilled every word that was promised about him. The time when Jesus, the Son of God, went to the cross and was crucified, and died, and was buried. And then he rose again on the third day. Amen. As our Savior and our King. Exactly what they decreed to him on that Palm Sunday walk is what manifested just one week later. This is the week that changed the world. Let's consecrate it to Him. Let's draw near to Him. Let's treat this week 
differently. We have much to celebrate and we have so much to be thankful for. Let's all stand together.